Hello, and welcome to another episode of Coding Secrets. In a previous video, I showed how the particle system we wrote for the PlayStation 2 could be used to create all the visual effects we used in our Crash Bandicoot games, as well as a whole bunch of LEGO games and even Transformers. But today we're going to have a look at how it was coded, and how it achieves the seemingly impossible with the PlayStation hardware. Obviously, the key feature of any particle system is flexibility coupled with performance. It's no good having an amazing particle system if it slows down the rest of the game. Equally, it's no good having the fastest particle system in the world if the effects are simplistic and repetitive. Obviously, we wanted the fastest particle system in the world with the most flexibility, and I think we came up with a pretty impressive solution. So let's have a look at how it was achieved. Also, please bear in mind that this was all implemented nearly 20 years ago by my colleague, Dave Dutson, so forgive me if I get some stuff wrong. So, here's an example particle effect which is demonstrating some complex things. Firstly, the particle is changing between many different colours during its lifespan, as well as changing its transparency. Secondly, it's changing sizes in a very complex way, scaling its width and height independently from each other and stretching and shrinking all the time. Thirdly, it's rotating as well as moving in random directions and under gravity. Now this is currently rendering just 32 particles, so let's emit a few more. Okay, so now we have over a thousand particles, let's take a look at how much time it is taking to calculate, process, run physics and draw this many. So here are some timing bars. The one in the middle shows how much of the frame is being used to draw using the graphics processor, or GPU. It's currently taking 41 scan lines doing various background tasks. Now the bar on the right is how much the main processor, or a motion engine as Sony called it, is being used, currently 57 scan lines. Now a frame, or a 60th of a second, totals around 460 scan lines. If we go over that, the frame rate drops below 60 frames a second. Finally, the bar on the left shows which is higher of the two bars. So if we now add our thousand particles and move so that we're not rendering the debug cube, we can see that the thousand particles takes around two scan lines of a motion engine time and 13 scan lines of GPU. Now a lot of the GPU is being used to draw quite large soft edged particles. So to see what is possible with the draw, I'll alter the texture being used by the particle and draw a few more of them. Okay, so now we have 7,147 particles being simulated and drawn, and we can see that it takes 6 scan lines of the Emotion Engine to process, and 23 scan lines of GPU to draw. A quick bit of maths shows that if we use the entire frame, we could draw just over 8.5 million particles per second. Now to put that in context, the fastest PS2 game engine I could find information about online was Jack and Daxter, which pushed around 15 million triangles a second and the PlayStation 2 got big rendering speed increases by rendering strips of triangles that shared edges, which happened a lot in scenes and character models. In contrast, rendering four-sided shapes, which these particles are, needed two triangles in one strip and then another two triangle strip for the next one, and so on, which was much less efficient as each strip was tiny. But even taking that into account, given that each particle used two triangles, that means this particle system could render around 17 million triangles a second. But of course this isn't just bulk rendering the triangles for geometry such as scenes and characters, it's also live calculating all the colours, scaling, rotation and physics. So how on earth does this particle system beat the fastest game engine out there while simultaneously running all that complexity? Seems impossible. Well, as usual, we dreamed up a very novel approach. We knew that to have a fast particle system, most of the code needed to run on one of the Emotion Engine's vector processing units, or VPUs. These were very specialised units that excelled in very fast 3D math, but they had very limited instructions and very limited memory. To process a particle system in the traditional way, the main processor would do all the work of storing the positions, momentums, colours, sizes, etc. of all the particles, and also process and store all of their physics and animation. Then the results would be transferred in small batches to the VPU for calculating the 3D positions and passing on to the graphics chip for drawing. But we knew if we could do all that main processor work directly on the VPU, it would be much, much faster. But we just didn't have the memory to store all the needed data, and sending data back and forth from the VPU to the main processor was very time consuming. However, we managed to come up with a crazy idea to make it work entirely within the VPU. There were always many different types of particle effects used in any given level of a game. So first we decided to process particles grouped by effect type, 
So if we were processing a flame effect, we would send the VPU all the flame particles being used at any given time. There was enough memory on the VPU to process them in batches of 32. So if there was, for instance, 48 flame particles currently on screen, we'd send them in two batches, one group of 32 and another group of 16. This decision meant we could load up the VPU's memory with everything it needed to process just the flame effect. First, we'd send any information that was common to every particle of the flame effect, for instance, the gravity, lifespan, start velocity, and so on. And then we'd send the information that was unique per particle, such as the random start momentum of the particle or its starting position. Now, this is where the magic comes in. We'd then send over exactly how old every particle currently was. If we knew how old the particles were, along with their original start positions, we could use maths to calculate exactly where they should all be at any moment by using their gravity, momentum, and so on. And if we use the VPU, which is extremely good at maths, to calculate that position from scratch every frame, we never need to know where it was last frame and never need to store any of the results or send any information back to the main processor, which means the code is much, much faster. In essence, we just tell the VPU what time it currently was and it would calculate from scratch where all the particles should be at that given time. But wait, you say, that's all very well for the movement, but what about all the possible color changes and sizes and so forth? They go through very complex patterns and the code to figure all that out and blend all the colors and sizes would be very slow. Well, that's where the next trick comes in. As well as the general information for a given particle effect, we would also load up the VPU with a pre-calculated 64 entry table that would tell it exactly what color, size and shape a particle should be at any point during its life. So if the particle lasted a total of 64 frames and was currently three frames old, all the VPU did was copy the color, size and so on from the third entry in the table. Obviously some particles had longer or shorter lifespans than 64 frames, so we just did a bit of maths to scale the lifespan to fit the table and then that would tell us which entry to use. We even did some interpolation if we landed between values to keep things smooth. Then, once all the flame effect particles had been passed off to be drawn, we'd then load up the VPU with the parameters and table for the next type of effect, for instance smoke, and repeat the process. So you can see that by using this method, we could calculate everything about a particle just by having its start parameters, a clever table, and knowing how old it currently was which kept everything processed within the VPU with no back and forth with the main processor, and that allowed it to be incredibly fast at processing very complex particles. Well, I hope you managed to follow at least some of that. It was a pretty complex coding secrets this time, and if you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like or even subscribing, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.